This is very, very exciting. So welcome to our vegan spirituality gathering. My name's Lisa Levinson and I'm the host of your gathering and I also have a co-host Judy Carmen who is the author of Peace to All Beings. So today we have a very special program for you. What we do is we explore veganism as a spiritual practice together. We do this online because of COVID-19, but also just to be able to reach people all around the country and around the world who are interested in practicing veganism as a spiritual practice. And we also have groups in person when we're permitted to do that. And those groups, you can find them on veganspirituality.com. There are about 10 to 15 groups around the country that have been meeting for several years and you can join one locally. And if there's not one in your area, you can reach out to us to start one. You can find us at veganspirituality at gmail.com. So without any further ado, I would love to welcome my co-host, Judy Carmen. And my name's Lisa Levinson, if I didn't mention that before. We're both so delighted to have this time together with you. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, we are. We're really thrilled to have these two wonderful guests, Milton Mills, and Victoria Moran, oh my gosh, we're just so thrilled um, to have both of you. It's very exciting, and you've got so much to share and just right on target with what we talk about. So um, I will start out by introducing Dr. Milton Mills. He is a graduate of Stanford University School of Medicine and is a critical care physician in the Washington DC area. And I understand he's been very busy all day and yesterday and is, is pretty tired and he's still joining us. So we really appreciate that. Um, and his, his preventative health care focuses on the unique challenges of minority populations. As a practicing Seventh-day Adventist, Dr. Mills promotes the teaching that God's original diet for humans was exclusively plant-based, uh, as it says in Genesis 1.29. He is a featured expert in the documentaries What the Health and A Prayer for Compassion, where he shares his wisdom on health and faith as it relates to the way we eat. Dr. Mills is also known for publishing several research journal articles dealing with racial bias in federal nutrition policy and frequently donates his time to practice at free medical clinics. So we're extremely honored to have you with us, Dr. Mills. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> and Victoria Moran uh, first learned about ethical vegetarianism as a young child through her nanny, whose minister was a Unity co-founder, Charles Fillmore. Um, she's the best-selling author of 13 books and more coming, I'm sure, including Creating a Charmed Life, which was published in 30 languages, The Love Power Diet, The Good Karma Diet, and The Iconic Main Street Vegan. She's the founder and director of Main Street Vegan Academy, a training and certification program for vegan lifestyle coaches. Moran also hosts the weekly Unity radio show that is very much worth listening to. It's called Main Street Vegan, and it's uh, and is also the lead producer of Thomas Jackson's um, acclaimed documentary, A Prayer for Compassion, which Dr. Mills is also in, um, and so is Victoria. Um, and so if you have not seen that film, you must see it. It's, it's just fantastic, and it needs to be shared literally to everybody in the world. <laughs> um, and so uh, you can learn more about Main Street Vegan at, and Victoria and her books at MainStreetVegan.net. Thank so, you. And happy birthday. Uh, thank you very much. I was not going to mention that, but it got out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, well, and, and I, again, we're so honored to have you both here um, to join us. You both just embody the values that we talk about every month on, on our show. 
of uh, vegan spirituality. And um, so I know everybody wants to hear about your vegan journeys and how those interact with your spiritual journeys. So um, who wants to go first? Milton, well, would you like to go first? Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. Then I'll, I'll well, just go ahead quickly. Um, I heard about vegetarians when I was five years old from the nanny that you alluded to when I came home with the four food groups. And she said, oh, I could take you to a restaurant and get you a hamburger made out of peanuts and you'd think you were having beef. Well, that restaurant <laughs> turned out to be at Unity Village. Now, we never went because she didn't drive and Unity Village is about 40 miles outside Kansas City where we lived. Um, but the Unity Inn had been this thriving vegetarian restaurant as, as early as the late 1800s. And by the 1920s, it was serving 1900 meals a day. So by the time I came along, it was no longer completely vegetarian. And yet that idea that there were people who, who could live without meat, that was strange and, and fascinating to me. And when I finally was able to do it, it was as a teenager when I started getting interested in yoga and read all three yoga books that were available at that time. And they all said, if you're gonna be serious about yoga, you have to practice ahimsa, harmlessness and reverence for life, and you have to be vegetarian. So I was able to do that. Vegan was a lot harder for me because I was dealing with a binge eating disorder. Plus, we're talking the early 1970s. It was a very, very different world. But I was very active, even as a vegetarian. And I hadn't realized how active until I Googled my maiden name the other night. That was a name I haven't used since 1977. And, and I found five magazine articles from way back then uh, about uh, having a group in Kansas City called Midwest Vegetarians and picketing a livestock and horse show and, and going to the um, World Vegetarian Congress in Maine in 1975. So it uh, goes back a ways, finally made it to vegan in 1983, have never looked back. I'm very grateful. So, Victoria, how does it relate to your spiritual life? Well, how is, I, I, how's it connected? I would not have made the leap, I don't think, successfully and permanently had it not been for the yoga connection. Because even though I had wanted to do it just for the animals, because I always cared so much about animals, but because I had these other things going on with the eating disorder and this and that, it, it would just, it seems so difficult. But with the spiritual thing there too, they kind of joined forces to, to move me forward. And today, just with everything I've studied, I mean, I got a degree in comparative religions and it's, you mentioned a prayer for compassion when, when Thomas Jackson called into my, my podcast, my Main Street Vegan radio show on, on Unity. And, and he said, do you want to produce my film? It's about veganism and spirituality. And it was like, well, I don't know how to produce a film, but my gosh, if it's about veganism and spirituality, my two great passions, what else can I do? So to, to me, it's, it's all, all very connected. Our concern for other beings and, and our care for our own physical structure and, and also just, just for this, this quest to know ourselves and to know the truth and to know God, it just seems that eating other beings would really get in the way of that. So uh, it's a win-win-win. Uh, Judy, you're oh, muted. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I meant to unmute and it didn't do it. Um, yeah, it's so well said, Victoria. Thank you so much. And I think a lot of us definitely can relate to that because that's why we're here on this vegan spirituality discussion. So thanks so much for that. So Milton, how about you? What's your, tell us about your journey. Um, yes, well, my journey is um, interesting. Um, and I'll just kind of launch right into it. Um, I initially was introduced to the Seventh-day Adventist church um, and denomination uh, when at the age of eight years, I was eight years old, my family moved across the street from another family that happened to be Seventh-day Adventist. And 
I became really best friends with um, uh, the third son in the family, Ronnie. We, were, we ended up being in the same class uh, in elementary school. And so we became really, really just the best of friends. However, um, my family um, it was, we would attend church on kind of holidays and occasionally uh, throughout the year, but uh, it wasn't um, anything really, um, uh, you know, consistent or um, like an every weekend sort of thing. But we were, of course, taught to believe in God and, and we were taught to say our prayers. And, and, and actually, my family had a tradition where um, when we sat down to dinner, which is something, interestingly, people rarely do these days, um, my father would say the blessing, and then uh, my brothers, each of my brothers, we would have to say a Bible verse um, before we started eating. But at any rate, um, when I was 13, my mother called us in and told my brothers and I that she and my father were getting a divorce. And um, my parents um, were very good friends. My father was a very, um, uh, my dad was a, a very gentle man in a, lot of, in a lot of ways in that he never raised his voice. He never uh, screamed or yelled or cursed. And, and so what I'm trying to get at was that my parents had not been um, arguing or fighting in front of us, this wasn't, it wasn't an acrimonious thing. And in fact, even after the divorce, they, they remained very good friends, which was, again, a blessing for my brothers and me. But nevertheless, to find out that my family was about to dissolve came as both a shock and um, just an incredibly painful experience for me. And so I, and in some ways, it was even more shocking because it was such a surprise. So my response to this was to wonder if the rest of my life was going to be a random series of unexpected, unavoidable, painful experiences, or if, in fact, there was some way to navigate life so that you could minimize these painful experiences and maximize the good ones. And, and my next thought was that the first question I had to answer um, and trying to figure all this out was, was God real? Did it, did God exist? Or was this all just a bunch of nonsensical, um, and useless behaviors? Because clearly if God did not exist, I did not want to spend my life in a useless round of religiosity and ceremonies that really didn't amount to anything. But the opposite, uh, uh, issue was equally true that if in fact God was real, then it would be absurd to try and live one's life without acknowledging it. So I initially started um, talking to clergy persons from different uh, denominations and um, I would ask questions. I mean, they would tell me things. I would ask questions about what they would tell me. And they, because some of the things they told me just didn't make sense. And when I would ask questions, I would we quickly get to a point where they would say, well, you know, this is just the way it is. You can't ask questions. You just have to accept it. And that didn't sit right with me because I thought to myself, why would God give me an intellect and then tell me not to use it? And if in fact God is real, then knowing God should be the ultimate intellectual experience. So I eventually decided that since I was hearing stuff that just didn't add up, didn't make sense to me, that I said, well, okay, fine, forget it. I'm, I'm going to, I, said, I basically said to God, I said, I'm going to, if you're real and you exist, you should be able to explain to me what your word means. And so I'm going to read the Bible and we're going to talk to you and see where this leads me. And, um, it, it was a very, um, obviously, a, a life-changing experience because I started talking to God in prayer, and he started talking back to me. 
And he spoke to me in a way that it was clear to me I wasn't playing games with myself. I wasn't talking to myself that there was this being that was speaking to me. And um, once I kind of got over the shock and the fear of it, um, I read what was in the Bible and um, talked to God. And he essentially, he led me to the Seventh Adventist Church because it was the church that was practicing what not only what was written in the Bible, but the doctrines made sense. The, instead of the Bible being this, this hodgepodge of confusing and um, disjointed uh, doctrines or uh, uh, behaviors, there was a logic behind it. And, and the, it became very clear that the Bible really was telling a very simple in some respects and straightforward story that God created a perfect world, human beings messed it up, but he, he loved us so much that he said, rather than allowing you to suffer the consequences of your actions, I'm going to fix this. I've got a plan and I'm going to fix it so that I can take you from where you've fallen and put you back where you were meant to be. And one of the central docs, so, I mean, one of the first things that is very um, uh, obvious about some of the Adventism is that they worship on the seventh day Sabbath. And um, that was something that, again, made sense because right there in Genesis, at the end of his creative week, God said, he took the seventh day of the week, he blessed it and made it holy, which means he, you know, he blessed it and hallowed it, which means that he set it apart and he put a blessing on it and he made that day holy. Well, that's not something that any human can either change or, or, or abrogate in any way. And um, after, you know, studying into religious history, um, it became clear that, um, back in the uh, sort of uh, fifth century, the decision was made by um, a clergy in the, uh, what was in, I guess, the Catholic Church that they wanted to draw a distinction between Christians and uh, Jews. And so they, or they basically said the Christians would stop worshiping on the seventh day, start worshiping on the quote, first day of the week. Well, and then when Protestantism, which came out of Catholicism, uh, uh, came into existence, they brought that practice with them out of habit and tradition. But again, there wasn't a b biblical uh, 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 basis for it. But the other thing that, uh, there were several other things that really um, drew me to the de denomination. One of them was the fact that right up front, after God creates Adam and Eve, he tells them what to eat. And he told them to be strict plant eaters. And interestingly, after they sinned and had to be put out of the Garden of Eden, he enlarged their diet, but it was still going to be a plant-based diet. And, and again, this is, this is why I, what, what I, I, I love about this, and this is what I mean by uh, things making sense, um, in, in chapter three of Genesis, God and Jesus are having a conversation and, and they say that we've got to do something with these sinful people. We've got to bar their access to the tree of life. Otherwise, they'll put forth their hands, eat of the fruit and live and become eternally living sinners. And that's why he, uh, it says he, uh, um, barred their access to the tree of life and put them out of the garden. Well, if the tree of life, if the fruit of the tree of life has the ability to perpetuate life indefinitely, then you can infer from that, that its fruit had within it properties that help restore and rebuild um, and replenish our bodies. And 
when we no longer had access to that fruit, we had to have more than a fruit-based diet because fruit, um, other types of fruit are relatively poor in proteins and another of essential nutrients. So he barred their access to the fruit of the tree of life, but partially replaced it with what were referred to as the plants of the field, which are your grains, legumes, uh, green leafy vegetables, root vegetables. So again, this is making sense to me. Um, and then I'll just give you this uh, really quickly. I mean, it, this is, it's kind of a deep discussion, but the other thing that never, that always uh, posed something of a conundrum to me was, we all know Jesus died for us on Calvary. He paid our debt. But I wondered, well, why did he have to die? Why couldn't God have simply said, okay, you guys messed up, you're sorry for it, and I am going to just say all is forgiven and we'll start over. Why did God's son have to die? And what became clear to me from studying the Bible and talking to God was that, I'm gonna give you an analogy. Let's say I invite you over to my house and I have this priceless, beautiful, exquisitely crafted, and essentially, you know, uh, crystal vase that's worth millions and millions of dollars. And, um, you know, someone starts horsing around, they knock it over and it shatters. Well, there are immediately two problems. One is, how do you pay for this thing that has been destroyed? But even if you imagine that someone could come up with the money to pay for it, the fact is it's still shattered into a thousand people, pieces. So how do you fix it? And the thing that the, the central, uh, many people think that the central doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the Sabbath doctrine, but it isn't. It's actually the doctrine of Jesus' ministration in the sanctuary. And the whole point of the sanctuary service um, that, that Moses gave to the Israelites was to teach them what Jesus would do with his blood once he was resurrected, that he would use it to remove the defects from our character and restore us to a state of perfection. And that's what his ministration in the sanctuary is all about. And when John saw him in the beginning of Revelation, he said, I saw him walking amongst the golden candlesticks, which were in the real sanctuary that was in heaven, as opposed to the man-made one on earth. But so, so suddenly I got it. God created a perfect world. We messed it up. He came up with a plan not only to pay the debt that, that sin uh, incurs, because once something becomes defective, it has to be destroyed unless it can be fixed. And Jesus's death both not only canceled out the, the defect and the death sentence, but it also allowed him to apply that blood to our characters spiritually to restore us to a state of, a state of perfection. So I'm gonna leave that there. The Adventist Church teaches that we should be plant-based because that is the diet God created us to eat. But it does not require it. What it does require is that we have to stop eating the unclean meats and follow the laws laid out in Leviticus but it does encourage us to be vegetarian. Well, I came from a family where we ate all kinds of meat and I considered it a big sacrifice. And my mother's a wonderful cook and I considered it a huge sacrifice that I had to give up pork, pork chops, ham and so forth. But I did not think I could live without uh, steaks, hamburgers and chicken. And so for about a year and a half after joining the church, I had given up the unclean meats, but I still ate meat. But I had progressed to a point where I was struggling with some personal issues and I was talking to God about it one night. Um, and this actually was in September of 1974. And I was 
agonizing about this, these things that I couldn't get past, that these, these, these problems I was having. And God said to me very clearly, he said, if you want a closer relationship with me, you have to have a clearer mind. And for that, you need a better diet. You have to stop eating me. And I remember at that moment, I felt this sort of, I guess the best way I can describe it is a free zone of panic, because I'm like, how am I going to do this? Um, and because I literally felt, and which is why I, I can relate to my um, audience members so, so often when they feel like I can't live without something. But I said to him, I said, God, if you want me to stop eating it, you have to take away the desire. And he did. And I stopped. Um, and um, from that point onward, I was a vegetarian. Now, I did still uh, eat things that had eggs and dairy in it, but I want to emphasize that the that it primarily came as um, uh, in the form of things that were made with, say, milk or eggs. Um, I did not, uh, I rarely ate what are called, what was referred to as visible uh, eggs or, or, and I couldn't, I was so lactose intolerant, I couldn't even look at a glass of milk or yogurt because it would make me profoundly ill. But if something were made with those items, I, I, I would eat that. But in um, uh, 19, late 90s, when I was working in a clinic, was when I started having um, African-American patients coming in complaining of problems with their bowels and thinking that they had a spastic colon or an ir irritable bowel. And after careful questioning, it was clear that they were still eating dairy foods and I would have them do a trial of no dairy. The problems would go away. And I was able to tell them, you're not, you don't have an irritable bowel. You don't have a spastic colon. You're just lactose intolerant. You shouldn't be eating these foods. But the uh, sort of denouement, for lack of a better expression, came when one older black woman told me, oh, I know I'm lactose intolerant. And I said to her, well, then why are you still eating these foods that are making you ill? And she said, because the government says I have to. The dietary guidelines say I have to have X number of servings of dairy every single day. And that really made me angry because by that point, I had done enough research to know that the federal government knew very well about the prevalence of lactose intolerance in African Americans and other uh, Americans of color. It also knew that African American women are genetically protected against developing osteoporosis, so that the number one reason given for consuming dairy foods, i.e. calcium and strong bones, which let me say parenthetically, dairy calcium does not build strong bones, dairy calcium does not prevent osteoporosis, but even that logic wouldn't apply to African Americans. And so basically they were being, they were being encouraged to eat dairy products simply so that people could make money off of them. And that's when I went to PCRM and I spoke to Dr. Neil Barnard, who's the head of PCRM. And I said, we need to do a paper on this so that we can make people aware. And that was the genesis of the two part uh, paper on racial bias in US dietary guidelines, um, of which I was co-author. Dr. Barnard was another co-author and um, the uh, principal author was Dr. Patricia Bertrand, who was a research dietitian who worked at PCR, PCRM at the time, and she did just an amazing job on the paper. And the paper was published and had a huge impact. And once it was published, um, the North American Vegetarian Society invited PCRM to come and present our findings at their annual conference, um, which occurred uh, in July every summer, called at that time it's called Vegetarian Summerfest. It's now called Vegan Summerfest. But even back then, it was a vegan event, uh, strictly vegan. They take over the campus of University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown, bring in their whole uh, uh, chef crew, and and for these four and a half days, you have this kind of vegan Shangri-La where you have hundreds of people just in this environment where everything is vegan and plant-based and nobody looks at you like you're weird. Nobody asks you, why are you doing what you're doing? You don't have to ask what's in that before you decide that you want to eat it. And it was, 
it still just really moves me when I think about that first experience with Summerfest. It was, it was just amazing. I felt like I had found my place. And because Summerfest was a 100% vegan event, I really got educated about the cruelty involved in the production of animal foods what happens in, in, in dairy production, what chickens are put through to create eggs. And, and also I became much more aware of the health problems associated with those products. And that's when I transitioned to being vegan, which was around the year 2000. So that's my story. <laughs> Thank you, Milton. My goodness, what a journey that was. And I learned a lot listening to you about Seventh-day Adventists. Um, that's really, really something that they have stuck with this for, for so many years. I started, what, around the turn of the century, um, early actually, 1900s? No, no, actually, Seventh-day Adventism grew out of the Millerite movement, which um, came into being in the 1830s to 1840s. Because okay. from studying the prophecies of Daniel, um, there's a prophecy um, uh, in Daniel where um, God says to Daniel, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And at that time, the Protestants in the uh, uh, 1830s thought that that meant that Jesus was coming back that to cleanse the earth. And there was this great, huge Millerite movement uh, that occurred and because they could actually, through, again, studying history, determine the date that the, the 2300 days, and in pro biblical prophecy, a day means a year. So the 2300 years started, and they knew that it ended in 1844. And so there was this huge movement throughout the United States and Europe, where people were preaching, you know, Jesus is coming back, the world is going to end. And they actually narrowed it down to a specific day in October, and they were all waiting for Jesus to come back, and he didn't. And of course, there was a tremendous disappointment. And people, you know, many people wrote out, wrote the movement off as just a bunch of fanatics and, and uh, people who were, you know, uh, off on some crazy tangent. But the core members of the movement said, look, we know that God cannot lie. We know that prophecy cannot fail. So clearly, if Jesus didn't come back, we misunderstood what was meant by the cleansing of the sanctuary. And that's when they went back and started studying into the sanctuary service and realized that the sanctuary service had two parts, uh, the ministration in the holy place, but then the... Uh, the special uh, sanctuary service that took place on the Day of Atonement, which is when the high priest went into the sanctuary to essentially remove the sins that had been transferred from the people onto the sanctuary to cleanse it, which is analogous to God's judgment on the earth and the removal of sins from our character and that's what they realize that we are in the true day of atonement. And that's why, again, the sanctuary service is uh, very central to, to the understanding of what the Bible is trying, trying to tell us. Um, and so, um, and, and one of the other things I will have to say as an African-American that really impressed me with the Adventist church was that from its inception, uh, and so out of that movement, the, some of the Adventist church came into being. And from its very inception, it was abolitionist. When, at a time when it was both unpopular and dangerous to be, um, to take an abolitionist position in the United States. And the church accepted Black Americans as full members of the denomination. Some of the other Protestant denominations, like the reason there's the Methodist Church and the African Methodist Church, is because the regular Methodists didn't want black people being part of the congregation. So they created the special Methodist church for the Africans, the AME. But the Adventist church says, no, we are all God's children. 
slavery is a sin and we are going to accept and embrace these people as fully part of our membership and part of the uh, fellowship of God. And I, again, it's difficult to put into words what that meant to me as a black man, but it, it meant that these people were listening to the voice of Jesus from the very beginning. Wow, yeah. Well, I can, uh, now I've learned some more about the Seventh Day Adventist. That's, that's remarkable. And thank you for sharing that with us, especially right now when, yes. you know, this is quite, oh, absolutely. quite an issue. Yeah. So that's just wonderful to know that about the Seventh Day Adventist. They got two really big things right, and, yes. um, <laughs> and probably many more. Well, so um, maybe we could move on. I did want to ask you both about current projects that you're working on. Um, Victoria, you want to take that on? Oh, well, I'm still so overcome <laughs> by everything <laughs> that you was talking about. I know, uh, me the, too. The personal story of, of what he, he found. And I think one way that our stories differ, and I feel, I feel, I've got to say just to everybody, I hope you don't mind Milton, but I've told him this before, that I feel like he was, you know, my, my brother from another mother. I mean, I'm just <laughs> so close to this guy. I, he's, he's the real deal. And I want to tell you a Milton Mills story. You know, we have, you know, in this age where everything's kind of divided, there's sort of a divide, you know, within the movement of people who do not eat animal foods, and we've got the vegans, and we've got the plant-based people, and it's kind of like, you know, there's a divide. And so I knew Milton as a medical doctor and as someone who had written these papers about health, and so I didn't know if he had the ethical vegan thing going on too, and I figured it's none of my business, I admire him a lot. So we're over in London at, for the VegFest UK, and we have a day off, so I take him to some of my favorite places. So on my 18th birthday, I moved to London. And this is where I actually managed to become vegetarian. It's also where I started studying yoga. Just so much opened up for me there. And one of my favorite places was a beautiful Anglican church called St. Martin's in the Fields. And I knew a guy who, who worked in there, he was a verger. And he would take me up into the bell tower and sometimes I'd get to ring the bells that would you know, <laughs> ring, I guess, maybe not all over London, but that's what it felt like to me. So I wanted Milton to see this church and they have a cafe uh, underground, they call it Cafe in the Crypt and, and gift shops and things like that. So we're in the gift shop and Milton was looking at uh, a keychain, and, and he said to the clerk, is this leather? And she said, oh, yes, sir, genuine leather. And he said, well, then not for me. And I mean, that just clinched it. So anyway, that's my uh, Dr. Milton Mills story. Uh, so current projects, oh my gosh. I am really looking, Judy, at this point in my life to zero in and simplify. And I think finding those articles that I told you about from 45 <laughs> years ago and longer, it was just like, okay, I've been doing this for a long time. And I don't know how much longevity I'm going to be given in this lifetime. And what I want to do with whatever I have left, whether it's short or long, is focus on what I really have to say and to do and what I'm really good at and to not just be so involved in so many things. So I am still involved in a lot of things. <laughs> like one thing that's taking a lot of time right now is the boycott meat campaign, which I know that um, <clears throat> Lisa and, and In Defense of Animals um, have, have joined that coalition where people have come together on behalf of the slaughterhouse workers. And so many people, so many vegans think, well, why would you care about them? You know, they're the enemy, they're killing the animals. But I learned, back in the 1990s when I spent a day undercover in a slaughterhouse that there are two groups of victims there. One certainly is the animals, but the other are those workers. They do not want to be there. That is not some kind of, oh my gosh, I got my dream job. I'm going to kill animals all day long standing in a refrigerator in, in blood, hearing horrible sounds and smelling horrible smells. So I know that these people are 
very, very mistreated and they have a really hard time of it. And now, of course, with coronavirus and they're being forced to go into these plants where their um, likelihood of, of, of getting the disease is much higher than for the rest of the population. So a lot of people have come together uh, as a coalition to support these workers. And what's interesting about these kinds of things is that there are some people who want to support the workers who don't have the full understanding of why somebody would want to be vegan for their whole life. And so what, what our hope is, and I think this is a very spiritual thing too, is I am vegan. I believe it with all my heart. I, I wish the entire world were vegan, not even yesterday, like 50 years ago, but I don't run everything. And so I'm, I believe I'm supposed to shine my vegan light and be as aspirational as I can be in my faulty human state and, and just allow for other people to come along as far as they're going to come. So I know in the boycott meat, it could be theoretically all these meat companies can say yes to the workers' demands. I kind of don't think that, but it could happen. And so some people might say, okay, we're done. We boycotted. This was a success. But for people like me, for people like all of the animal rights and, and the plant-based health people who are part of the Boycott Meat Coalition, uh, you know, we've been boycotting meat for a long time <laughs> and um, uh, intend to continue that and, and sharing that with everybody for every reason uh, far into the future. So I guess the other thing uh, for me as I continue to do my weekly podcast and uh, Dr. Mills and Reverend Carol Saunders are gonna be on that um, next month to talk about our, our conference, whether we're gonna be in person or some other way, we're gonna talk about vegan spirituality and what it will mean to get together in some context or other um, to, to celebrate that. And it is a, a very exciting thing. I think it's kind of a almost, uh, repeat of 1893 when that first World Congress of, of Religions happened in Chicago and people of different religious beliefs were really talking together for, for the first time. And I'm a writer. I mean, you mentioned that I've written 13 books. And I used to think when my daughter was little, I was in La Leche League, the breastfeeding moms organization. And I was there because I wanted to do a good job with my one kid. But there were a lot of women in that organization. I mean, one was never enough and they needed five or seven or nine. And, and I kept thinking, but you have so many. Why, you know, why do you need another one? That's how it is for me about books. You know, I have so many and I need another one. And so um, I just, my, my prayer every day is, is to be given the courage and the confidence to go forward with the book that I'm supposed to be writing next. So anybody who's listening who likes to pray for other people, you can pray for my next book and me, and we'll see where that goes. Awesome. Well, I Milton, think uh, go ahead, Victoria, go ahead. I was oh. just saying thank you to my brother. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Your brother well, from another mother. Yes. <laughs> so um, as far as projects that I'm working on, um, the main project that I'm working on is the one that I've been working on for the last 30 plus years of my life. Uh, and that is to write the book that definitively explains to people that human beings are not omnivores, we're not carnivores, we are plant eaters. And all of the work that I've done up till now is a part of that. And I, I will say parenthetically that the, a big part of the reason that I have not been able to just sit down and write the book is because I have to work to take care of my family and helping um, my parents out which they live in separate households and they, my dad turns 86 on the 25th of this month. My mother will turn 86 in November and just having to work as much as I do kind of limits the amount of time I can devote to writing. But ultimately my goal is to help people understand that we are plant-based creatures and that 
when we adhere to that diet, it is better for us in every way, um, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And um, that if people would adhere to the plant-based diet, it would even help with issues of, of, of um, adolescent angst and juvenile delinquency. Because when you look at plant-based populations that are strictly plant-based, typically the boys and girls go through puberty in their mid to early late teens, like 14 to 16 or, or so. Well, when you look at teenage mental development, um, and I think the bar mitzvah is a, um, uh, a testament to this, which occurs at age 13. That really is the point at which a, um, a person's thinking changes, where you stop seeing yourself as just a kid, but you start to um, look at yourself as a person in this world and try to make sense of life and of who you are within this life. And what's interesting is that if kids were allowed to go through that process unfettered by sexual development and sexual desire, by the time their body began to develop sexually in their, uh, it's, let's say they were vegan, which would be 14, 15, 16, they would already have a much better sense of who they are as a person and what's important and what's real and what's not real. But the way it's done in Western societies, because we're, we eat these diets that are laden with animal protein and animal fat, which accelerates uh, physical development, basically it's like giving a, a high-powered Ferrari to a child that doesn't know how to drive. And I think that that's why so many kids end up getting pulled in the wrong direction because their body, bodies develop before their minds. And if they, in fact, had eaten a fully plant-based diet, by the time their body began to change into its adult form, they would already be better prepared to handle it. Um, and the, the other thing that has really struck me over the last several years is that I've met several people who told me a story of how their vegan journey impacted their character and their outlook on life. And <clears throat> what struck me about these stories were the fact that these people told these stories as something that happened to them. Um, and I, I'm, I'm gonna, there's a, a rapper named Gray uh, who's, uh, uh, really famous for he did this vegan rap about thanksgiving a few years ago that went viral around the world but i was uh, last year i was at a the black vets fest in brooklyn and gray was there and he told his story about how he uh, transitioned to veganism and what happened to him internally and he he said you know prior to becoming vegan he said i was a guy that didn't smile a lot he said i wasn't mean or angry he said i just you know with all the things that you know you have to deal with as a black man in this world i was just very serious he said but i noticed that after i stopped eating animals my personality and my outlook on life changed he said i started to notice the sunrise i started to notice the animals and i got to the point where i didn't want to hurt anything um he said even if i found a roach in my house, I would pick it up and take it outside. And, and now and you would, it, it's almost hard to believe that, that Gray never smiled because he's got the biggest, broadest, most amazing smile, like he's lit from within. Um, another friend, um, Josh Lejeune, who uh, is very uh, um, uh, famous because he, he uh, before he be, became uh, uh, vegan, he weighed, I think something like around 350 pounds. He transitioned his diet, uh, began running and lost um, over 200 pounds. But, and, and Josh is this 
he again he's like this incredibly loving effusive warm person but he told me he said no if you had known me before i was vegan you wouldn't have liked me because i was racist because i'm from louisiana and that's how i was raised he said but after i changed my diet my personality changed and i heard and i've heard similar stories over and over again so i know that this diet changes you spiritually as well um and so my goal in life is to help people understand that if we were all plant-based we would be kinder and more loving to each other to ourselves to the creatures we share this planet with um and to the planet itself uh, I, i'll share one more little anecdote um uh, a little over a year ago, I was invited along with a friend of mine by the name of Roberta Schiff to come up to Rochester to do a series of talks and lectures on what the Bible tells us and teaches us about plant-based eating and animal rights. And I decided that, well, I needed to go back and reread what the Bible actually said, um, just to kind of familiarize myself with the scriptures. And, and, um, and I got the shock of my life because I was rereading Genesis and um, in Genesis chapter two, Genesis chapter one gives you kind of a sort of a, a, a overview of creation. And then Genesis chapter two goes into more detail. And there comes a point where God creates Adam. And again, father and son are talking and they said, it is not good that the man should be alone. All my life, I thought God then created Eve. And if I were, and when I asked people, what did God do after he said, it is not good for the man to be alone? Everybody says he created Eve. That is not what the Bible says. It says, then God formed the animals from the dust of the earth and brought them to Adam so he could give them names. And you don't name inanimate objects, you name beings. And it was from Adam's interaction with his first companions, his first friends, he saw them with their uh, mates that he realized, I don't have a mate like these, these, my animal friends. And it was at that point that God put him to sleep, removed his rib and created Eve. So the Bible teaches us that not only are we meant to be plant-based, but that animals were put here as our companions and friends and not to be abused, mistreated, and misused. And lastly, when God had to change his creation because sin entered the world, it said he had put a curse on the earth. And part of that, uh, the signs of that curse is that plants suddenly had to defend themselves and they grew thorns and thistles. And the reason Jesus wore the crown of thorns on Calvary was because he was not only redeeming us, he was redeeming the earth from the curse. Wow. Can I just add to that? Jude? Sure. Um, wow. When, when you asked about stuff that I'm doing, I always think about, you know, what are you doing that's very, very serious and very focused on you know, the cause. And yet something that I'm doing right now that's really cool, while well, I'm spending my life pretty much on Zoom, as, as we are now, like everybody here, I think, could uh, chime in with that. So one thing I'm doing is my Main Street Vegan Academy that trains vegan lifestyle coaches is we're doing our first Zoom class. Dr. Mills is one of our wonderful instructors. So that's going on. But on the side, just for myself, I'm taking a yoga teacher training class on Zoom. And I did get into yoga a long, long time ago uh, when I lived in London. And I, I found my yoga teacher over there since. I, I hadn't talked to her in decades and I thought perhaps she'd passed away. But I found her on Facebook and when I was there last year, I took a yoga class with her. She's 94 and still teaching. Wow. And uh, so she, she said, this is Victoria, and she studied with me 51 years ago. And this lovely woman in the front row said, oh, welcome back. But so I go back with that. But I was telling a friend that I feel like that gift, you know, the, the whole, you know, yoga was given to me so long ago. 
and I would, I would stick my hand in and I would pull pieces out and I'd kind of look through the box and I'd do a little bit and I'd put it back in the closet. And I feel now like finally I've taken out the entire box and really opened it up. And I'm just, you know, delving into everything that I possibly can. And I found an interesting story, you could call it a legend, but it comes from a monastery in the Himalayas. And the story is that about 2000 years ago, a very radiant young man from the Middle East came there to study and they believed that it was Jesus and somebody painted this picture. So I hope you can see it without too much glare. And what I find so beautiful about this picture is that he's surrounded by the animals. So you can see the birds and a bunny. There's a little lizard crawling on him. And over here, there's a, a sleeping tiger. And to me, the idea of a really spiritual person, whether we're talking about divine or just us, is that the animals know what kind of person they're dealing with and um, can just be there with him or with her. So I guess that's a big goal too. And I just want to talk up my daughter for a second. It's funny, and I think anybody who has children will relate to this, that when your kids grow up, they take some of you with them and then they bring in some of their own stuff. And so all the spirituality that's been so important to me, my daughter is kind of left at the side. You know, for her, she's very pragmatic. I think you'd call her an ethical, humanist, vegan, <laughs> wonderful person, but just kind of leaving the spiritual stuff to, you know, when, when you get there, you'll find out. And yet the, the love that she shows regarding animals just makes me so, so happy. And she and her husband are actors. And so the show that they were traveling with is not happening now. And every time I talk to her from up in Vermont where she is with the in-laws, she has found another little creature. And sometimes they're creatures that most people think are kind of ooh, icky or ooh, you, you, you would touch that being you you know that that one has so many legs you know you would actually but she's just there like saving life and i think a long time ago when i was a young seeker i was living in a um, spiritual organization in illinois and, and working in their library and the woman there told me about how she um there was an epidemic of flies in Minneapolis where she lived and she was going around you know, swatting the flies and spraying the flies in her workplace, which was a dental office. And one of the patients said, do you have a little cup and a piece of paper? She's like, yeah, what, what? And he would catch the fly and take them outside. And she said to him, what are you doing? It's a fly. And he said, nobody knows what life is. And I feel like that is something I've inculcated in my daughter. And even though she's not all excited about reading theology <laughs> and the scriptures of the world, I think the essence of theology and the scriptures of the world is to have this awe and this reverence for life and the ability to see God in every creature and care for every creature as the divine in expression. Mm. It's very beautiful. Um, you know, one of the, I think one of the most moving and beautiful passages in the Bible is the very famous passage from the 11th chapter of Isaiah, where he's prophesying of the time when sin will have been banished from the earth evil will be no more. And you, it's the very famous uh, um, portion about the lion shall lie down with the lamb and eat straw like the ox, that children will play with animals that formerly were dangerous and deadly. And it, it, it sums up by saying, none shall hurt nor destroy in all of my holy mountain for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge, knowledge of the Lord. Of the Lord. 
Yes. As the waters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cover the sea. Exactly. I'm just trying to do a little duet there. <laughs> <laughs> That's so beautiful. And you know, I see Lisa's beautiful face there. I think we're getting close to the end of the hour. Um, wow. Oh, it's a little wow. after eight. Um, I'm wondering uh, if people have questions. Um, Lisa, do you think we have time to open up for questions for a little bit? Yeah, we do have qu time for questions. So if anyone, would like uh, to, you can either type your question into the chat box or you can um, turn on your, your webcam and share them and talk to us about it. Uh, if you're on the phone, um, there is a dial-in that you can use as well. So it's either four or six, but it should be on the, the information when you first dial. And if there were any other questions, I don't see any right now. So if there were any other questions that we didn't get to, you can go ahead and maybe ask those. There might be a couple things that, if there were. Yeah. Um, I might mention um, that, and maybe everybody knows this, but, but Lisa and I and Victoria and Milton are involved in planning the 2020 vision, a world that works for all, which is supposed to take place at Unity Village, which um, Victoria mentioned earlier. And in, so that's close to Kansas City. Um, we don't know yet if it's gonna take place, it's gonna depend a lot because on uh, the COVID thing. Um, it, it's scheduled for September 10th through the 13th. And um, we may end up, if we can't have it in person, um, we may end up doing some Zoom uh, kind of uh, event, which won't be quite the same, but then um, the way this is planned out, it's, it's a three-day thing. It really was in, Victoria's inspiration in the first place. And so we will have it someday. If we don't have it in September, it will happen maybe next spring or the following fall. And it'll still be a 2020 vision, even if it's in 2021. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, we invite everybody to uh, at least look at what we've got planned. Uh, it's, uh, the website is thespiritualforum.org. Um, and then forward slash vegan dash retreat. So uh, go take a look at it. And uh, if you do register and we do have to cancel, of course, uh, you'll get your money back. And um, well, actually, we can apply it to the future yes. one. So yeah. yes, yeah, we're definitely going to do this, whether it's this year or next year, we yeah, will we'll definitely have, have this it. event. It's a very special opportunity to um, kind of practice some of the faith-based advocacy that we've been hearing about from um, Milton, from Dr. Mills and Victoria, and to really come together to brainstorm and to share techniques and like uh, tools about how can we bring this um, awareness into our places of worship. And everybody's doing this, has been doing this on their own, in their own various ways, whether it's through podcasts or through um, uh, passing out different literature. Now we want to gather all together and share the tools from whether it's Jewish Veg or the Christian Vegan Association or the Vegan Muslims group. Group We're going to join together and um, share ideas and collaborate on how we can help promote veganism um, going forward into this, this new decade. So we hope you can join us. I'll, I'll put in a little link <laughs> if you're interested. I just I want to say something because I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't mention this uh, because we are, as we all know, in the midst of this COVID epidemic. And I think, you know, when things like this happen, there's always, how do we deal with it? You know, uh, sort of in a practical standpoint, but I also think it's important to step back to ask, why did this happen? And what are the larger lessons that we need to learn from this? And if you look at the plagues um, that um, afflicted Egypt when Moses was there to deliver Israel 
from <clears throat> their bondage. Each of those plagues was directed at one of the false gods that were worshipped in, uh, in Egypt. And it was designed to make people stop and think about where they were putting their energy, their allegiance, um, and their, uh, their sort of mental focus. And to give them a chance to step back, to pause, and say, should I be doing the things differently? And COVID happened because humans were eating and abusing animals. And many of the major illnesses that afflict us, particularly as epidemics, come from our mistreatment and abuse of animals. And I think that one of the things we have to do when we have this time, when we are literally being forced to sit back, to stop, to think, to reflect, is to ask ourselves, are we doing the right thing when we cage, abuse, mistreat, and butcher animals? And if these illnesses and plagues are coming from the things that we are doing to these animals, should we be doing it at all? And of course the answer is no. And I, I mentioned a while ago that one of the things that I hear very often from people when I talk about the need to change diet is people say, oh, but Dot, I love. Oh, I can't live without X. And I understand that because as I said, I once felt that way. I once believed that I would not be able to, to, to just exist unless I could eat a piece of meat. Once I was delivered from that, thankfully, and I praise God for that every day, I realized that that was just an addiction. It was something that I had gotten used to because I had been taught to do it. And so I always remind people that nobody asks for fried chicken, ice cream, or pork chop in the delivery room. And that's because babies are born without preferences. The only thing a baby wants is his mother's milk. Everything else that we think that we have to have, that we can't live without, was something that we were taught to want. And just as we were taught to want and desire things that are unhealthy and that destroy not only our life, but the life of the planet, and of course, the life of other creatures, we can choose to jettison those bad habits and those dysfunctional ways of living and instead embrace a diet and a lifestyle that is better for us physically, mentally, and spiritually, but also better for the planet and that does not entail cruelty to God's other creatures. <clears throat> and I think that's a lesson we need to take from this COVID epidemic because if we weren't eating this way, this would not be happening to us. Mm. So Amen. True. Yes, very true. We're so um, grateful that you mentioned that specifically during our our talk today, because that's what is happening in our world around Absolutely. us right now. Absolutely. Yeah. So this could be a great awakening, and that's what I'm really praying for. I think we can all pray for that, that people will put those things together and understand, you know, that it's not just, we're not just asking them to be nice to animals. It's also for them, for their Absolutely. own health. It's for the earth. It's for the starving people. It's, it's just, yeah, it just spreads out to everything. And like you said so beautifully, Milton, that it changes you inside. It changes your heart and you become a compassionate person. And, and that's what a gift that is. So, yeah, thank you for talking about that. And uh, I think we saw several chats. Uh, they want you to get that book written. <laughs> <laughs> well, please pray for me and pray that God will open the doors and the opportunity so that I can have the dedicated time to, to do it. Because the, in the one sense, the book is already written. It's just a matter of getting it down on paper. On to the paper. Yes. I even have a name for it. 
Tell what is it? Diet by design. Ooh, like it. Beautiful. Ooh, yeah. right that is so nice. Somebody steals your title. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> we are all, that is, we all know. We are all witnesses right here. This That's is right. Milton's title. Yeah. We know that. <laughs> so we will honor that. Mm -hmm. And I'm so yeah. looking forward to reading that book. There are, we have a couple of questions if you'd like, if you'd like sure. to take another couple minutes. Um, so one of them is, one of them is just asking whether you uh, speak with your patients, this is for, for Dr. Sure. Mills, whether you speak to your patients um, and advise them to move into veganism and do you speak with them about the connection between um, uh, their health and veganism and their spirituality? Well, I certainly, um, within the hospital, one has to be very careful about giving the appearance of trying to force my own um, agenda or beliefs onto patients. So I'm much more careful about talking about the spiritual aspect of it unless a patient broaches that. But every opportunity I get, I do try and point out the linkage between what we eat and the diseases that we get. And, and there, there actually is um, frequently an oppor opportunity to do that. As I mentioned, uh, or as uh, uh, Judy mentioned when she read my bio, I'm a critical care doctor. So I see people who come in with, uh, you know, diabetes uh, out of control or heart attacks. And uh, I, I remember this one gentleman, uh, he was uh, a fairly young gentleman. He was in his um, uh, late forties, but he was back in the hospital for, I think his third or fourth cardiac stent because he would get these blockages, develop a severe ch chest pain, he'd put in a stent, open it up, but he'd go out and develop another blockage. And, and he was starting to have complications uh, and uh, you know, the side effect of the medicines. And I, I saw in his face that he was starting to become discouraged. Um, like, you know, as in I'm dying and I can't stop this process. And I did take that opportunity to talk to him about the fact that, you know, Stents deal with the acute problem, but they don't deal with the disease. And the disease is the accumulation of cholesterol and fat that comes from the foods that we eat. And that there was a way to reverse this, to not only stop it, but reverse it, if he was willing to make um, the, the uh, appropriate dietary changes. I've talked to patients with very bad diabetes about the same thing, and, and several of them have uh, um, embrace the change. And um, um, one of my star patients um, was a very good friend of mine named Kathy. And I, I, I want to tell Kathy's story because um, she's, um, you know, she passed away a few years ago, but I want her story to still inspire people. And this was 20, this is more than 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago when I first started taking care of her. And at that time, Kathy had had diabetes for 17 years. Um, it was so out of control that she was on large doses of insulin twice a day, plus uh, oral pills. And still her blood sugars were averaging in the range of two to 300 when normal is around 80 to 100. Um, she had become disabled by her diabetes because she developed severe um, blockages in her leg arteries and she would get claudication or severe pain after walking just a block. Um, her sugars were so elevated she couldn't see well because she couldn't focus and, and she had really severe heart disease. And um, I was working at a free clinic at the time in Alexandria where she was a patient and she asked me, if she could become my patient. And I said, sure. Um, and we also happened to go to the same church and I started talking to her about her diet. And I was hoping to convince her to become vegetarian first. And Kathy 
immediately became vegan. And she eliminated all, you know, meat, dairy, eggs. And over the next six to eight weeks, I had to start to basically wean her off all of her medications. And um, eventually she was off all of her diabetes medications. She came off uh, several of her heart medicines, two out of her three blood pressure medicines. The blockages in her legs cleared up and she would go out and she'd walk a mile and she was actually able to go back to work. Um, and um, I witnessed her getting her life back. And, um, and it was just, it was just this amazing thing to see. And uh, Kathy would even um, go with me uh, to do lectures so she could tell people her story. And, um, and so I'd like to continue to tell her story because I want the beauty and goodness that her life demonstrated to live on um, so that her story can continue to inspire and um, uh, motivate other people that it is possible to become healthy and to get your life back and to be able to enjoy life once again. Um, and so, yes, I, I absolutely do take every opportunity I can to talk to people about the link between their diet and their health. And if the opportunity presents to also discuss the spiritual aspects of it. Mm. Beautiful. Well, we do have another question <laughs> and maybe this will be our final one. It's kind of, a, it's a two part question. So it is one that um, actually Vince was asking and it's, actually asking how can we help the people who are in these these um, faith traditions to um, to acclimate to a vegan culture that aligns with the values promoted by their founders so I think he's addressing that perhaps all um, uh, of the people that practice in both Dr. Mills your tradition and also Victoria in your tradition may not all be vegan so how how do we address the spiritual communities themselves well that was actually on your list of questions for this so i'm so glad vince you must be psychic <laughs> that you have <laughs> because i've been thinking about it and i actually came up with with two thoughts one is the interfaith movement itself and we are part of of the vegan interfaith coalition interfaith vegan coalition and the idea that until fairly recently in history, the idea that people of other religions would communicate rather than go to war over differences, this is fairly recent. And so I think the more that we can have this cross-pollination of understanding other beliefs, then as some of us have veganism as one of these beliefs as well, we can bring that in. And then another thing that seems a little bit contradictory, but I think it's also, it goes hand in glove with the whole interfaith idea and talking cross faith is also really going into your own tradition, whether it's the one you grew up in or, or one that you discovered, but this, this place where you do feel most at home. So just think about the difference in a conversation. Somebody could say, oh, this, this person showed up at our church and, and they were vegan, and oh my God, they were talking about animals and, and arteries and, and, and global warming. I'm just so glad when they finally left. Or <laughs> one of the elders in our church has, has become vegan. And I don't know that it's anything I would ever want to do, but you know, he's lost a lot of weight. He's off his diabetes medication. Maybe there's something to this. All this to say that people trust people who are like them more than people who aren't like them. And hopefully we will all grow and evolve so that we'll be more open to understanding all kinds of people. But human nature is as it is that if you, you, know, you are a whatever, a Baptist and I'm a Baptist and you talk to me about veganism, I'm gonna be much more open. 
And I think that, that we really need to look for these ways. And, and certainly like Milton talked about, not all Adventists are, are vegetarian. And, and I grew up kind of sort of in unity, kind of partly Catholic and partly in unity. That's a whole story. But unity was, was formed by very strict vegetarians. And I think many people listening to this are familiar with Carol Saunders' wonderful book of Charles Fillmore's writings and how they used to, they, they found some kind of faux leather to bind their Bibles in in the 1890s. I mean, really, this was a big, big deal to them. And yet nowadays, you know, it's very scary because of all the things that people are asked to do in religious traditions. And, and the people are asked to, to give things up. They're asked to give money. They're in many traditions asked to give 10% of their money. You know, that's a chunk if you haven't been given it before. You know, they're asked to, to uh, rein in their sexuality if maybe they haven't been doing that before. These are big things people get asked. But to ask somebody to change how they eat goes back to that wonderful quotation that that it's easier to change a man's um, religion than to change his diet and I think when the dietary change is vegan it's almost like asking people to change their diet and their religion so those are my thoughts well my my thoughts are we could have a whole nother hour on this but I'll try to keep it simple um, what's interesting about the Bible is not only what it tells us, but how it tells us. And again, you go back to Genesis and God's first conversation with Adam and Eve was he told them what to eat. He actually told them not only what to eat, but he told them to quote, dress the garden and keep it. In other words, get some exercise. Um, and then after they fell and became sinful, part of that first conversation with them was he broadened and enlarged their diet and then also told us that now you're going to have to work much harder to keep yourself healthy because your body is now starting to fall apart. Hence, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. And people often say that he, that conversation was a punishment, but that's not what it says. He says, cursed is the earth for your sake. I'm doing this to help you, to help counteract the tendency of your body now to become sick and, and weak and fall apart. But the other important part is that when human beings were sinless, we had the opportunity to communicate with God face to face. The Bible says he came down into the garden in the evening um, uh, every day to spend time with um, uh, Adam and Eve. But of course, now that we are sinful creatures, we can't be in his presence because his presence would destroy us. So that means that we have to communicate with him through our mind, through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Well, I live in uh, Virginia, the Washington DC metro area, but I grew up in California and that's where my mom and my dad and my other family members live. And so the way that I communicate with them is through cell phone technology. But we all know that the quality of that interaction is only as good as the cell phone and my carrier. If I've got a cheap off-brand cell phone that drops calls, has a lot of static, and I have a carrier that doesn't have great coverage, I'm not going to have great communication with my loved ones. Likewise, if our minds are clouded and, and sick and filled with pollutants and garbage from the things that we are eating and in our brain uh, vessels, the vessels that supply blood and oxygen to our brain are clogged up with grease, fat, and cholesterol, we're not gonna have very good communication with God. And I think that that's part of the reason that so many religious people haven't made and arrived at that spiritual understanding is because their connection with God is so sketchy. So we gotta get back to basics. We have to, and I'm going to throw this into God's court and say that if we adopt the diet that he wants us to eat, it will improve our communication with him. We will be able to hear his voice more clearly. We will develop a closer, more spiritual bond and relationship with him. And that will also spread out to all of the people that we interact with. 
and and he will tell us how we can reach people. But one of the most important things is is as Victoria says, we will lead by example. That when people look at you and they see that, well, boy, we're the same age, but you're more fit, you're healthier, you don't have all these aches and pains and complaints, you are happier, you are more settled spiritually, and you seem to have a better understanding of God and the beauty of interacting with him, they're going to want that. And that will be how we draw people to us. It's like Jesus said, you light your candle and you put it on the lampstand and people will come. Wow. Amen. We are so, so grateful to both of you for sharing your wisdom with us and your journeys with us. I feel like we've gotten to know you better and, and that's part of this is we're building community here. We sure. can share these messages and we did have people ask, will people be able to watch us again? Um, it has been live on the Vegan Spirituality Facebook page. So you can always go there to check it out. And we'll also post this on uh, YouTube on the Vegan Spirituality Playlist which is one of In Defense of Animals' YouTube channel. So you can find it there. If you were tuning in with us on the webinar, you'll get a replay link um, tomorrow. So thank you so, so much. Um, was there a closing? Did anybody want to do a closing? Sounds like Judy's nodding her head. Yeah? I believe Dr. Mills was going to give us a closing. Oh, wonderful. Right? Yeah. All right. Well. Let us spiritually join hands, bow our heads, and we'll say, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together, commune with you, receive wisdom and blessing from your spirit, and get a greater understanding of the beauty and joy that you want for us and that you are trying to give us. So help us to receive these blessings, to receive these words, give us understanding, give us spiritual development, and lead us to that pathway that brings us into your light. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we'll do an amen. extra extra blessing for your, your book and also for Victoria's next book. Nice. The world is waiting for these lovely, um, uh, I was going to say, uh, scriptures, but I think using that term very loosely, <laughs> the world is waiting for your words of wisdom. So um, this has been such a delight. I feel like we did enter into a sacred space um, today yeah. in our gathering, and we encourage everyone to join us. You can um, find out more about our gatherings at veganspirituality.com, and we do gather each month to um, meet with different leaders in our community and to, sh to share and to um, to cross pollinate and to be in, in loving connection with each other. So thank you so much to our, our guests. And also thank you to the people who've attended. We're all part of this conversation. That's the beauty of it. We're all together sharing this wonderful light and um, this energy. So we hope that you take this in, enjoy it, and that we'll, we'll see you next time. Thank you, Judy, for being our co-hostess with the mostest. <laughs> and we hope you have a lovely evening, everyone. Yeah. Have a good night. All right, wonderful. Night. Take care. God bless. Thank you, everybody. God bless. All right. God bless. Mm -hmm.